All right, now that we've covered essentially the conceptual parts of the fork join pool, what I want to do is talk about some of the key methods that you'll use, both with the fork join pool as well as the fork join task class hierarchy. So these are actually what you'll do for the next programming assignment, for assignment two. So when you look at the code, you'll see that fork join pool extends abstract executor service that provides some reusable elements that are leveraged by other other thread, uh, thread pools like the uh, thread pool executor and scheduled thread pool executor and the fork join pool. And therefore, because it implements abstract executor service, which in, in uh, turn implements the executor service interface, there's a bunch of methods that are used to execute runnables and submit callables and, and so on and so forth. Uh, these particular methods don't actually leverage the powerful fork join pool uh, features. It just is a way to take runnables and callables and, and run them in a fork join pool, but it doesn't really leverage the cool stuff that we're going to be focusing on here. So instead, what we're going to be focusing on are the methods in fork join pool that implement the fork join tasks or execute the fork join tasks or better arrange to execute the fork join tasks. So execute, invoke, and submit. And what all these things do, these are the methods that non-fork join task clients use in order to be able to give work to the threads in the worker threads in the fork join pool. So execute, invoke, and submit. And these are what are actually useful, right? So the fact that the other methods exist is kind of an interesting sideline or footnote, but we're not going to use them. So execute will arrange an asynchronous execution. There will not be a result that will come back. It just executes this fork join task, which needs to have some side effect if it wants to have any impact on anything. There's another method called invoke. And what this does is this will perform the fork join task and it will block, the call to invoke will block until the task is complete, in which case it returns element type T, which is the return result from that fork join task. In contrast, execute does not return a value, but invoke does. So execute doesn't block, whereas invoke does, or blocks the caller. And then the final method here is called submit. Submit takes a fork join task, and it will arrange it to run, and it'll return a future to the result, which you can then obtain through some other means. By default, the size of the fork join pool is the number of cores available to the Java virtual machine. So under the hood, if you were to take a look at the constructor for fork join pool, it will go ahead and create a pool that has as many cores as the underlying virtual machine thinks is available for that hardware platform, which could be four or eight or two or 16 or whatever it happens to be, whatever your hardware supports. You can also control the size of the pool by giving a parameter. So you can say, I want a fork join pool with you know, parallelism number of threads in the worker thread. There's also yet another way, which is something called the common fork join pool. This is a feature that was added in Java 8. And there's a static method called common pool that returns the common fork join pool. And there's only one of them. And that's actually quite common to use, as the name implies, and is, in fact, the way it's used when we talk about the Java parallel streams framework that we'll cover later. The common pool is typically used by any fork join task that's not explicitly submitted to a specified pool. So if you don't want to make your own fork join pool, you just use the common pool, and it'll run everything in one gigantic pool. There's also a bunch of other little helper methods that you can use to figure out what's going on. You can see like what's the parallelism level of the pool, how many worker threads have started but not yet terminated, what's the number of items that are queued up for running, stealing, all kinds of different things. So that's the fork join pool interface. And you'll get a chance to play around with some of the methods there for assignment number uh, two. And you'll also get to play around with the common fork join pool. Let's talk a bit about fork join tasks. So a fork join task is an abstract class. Just means you have to subclass it to do anything useful. And it implements the future interface. <coughs> and 
future is just a very simple interface that lets you get the result of a computation that is executed asynchronously in, in a pool somewhere. The fork method on the fork join task enables a task to create subtasks, one or more tasks, that will run in parallel in a fork join pool. And basically what it'll do, it, it sort of arranges to asynchronously execute the task in the current task pool or the fork join common pool, depending on how you've initialized things. And as I mentioned before, what fork does is it pushes the task or the subtask onto the head of the deck that's owned by the current worker thread. So the current worker thread is whatever thread you happen to call the fork in. Join returns the result of a computation when the computation is done. And it blocks, using the word loosely because it doesn't actually block, it logically blocks the calling task until the fork subtask is done. And by logically blocked, all I mean is that there's actually other processing that can be taking place in that worker thread, but this computation will not return from join until that subtask that it's associated with actually completes, and the worker thread will figure that out. Something else that join does is it defines a synchronization point. And uh, this is a very important concept in parallel programming or concurrent programming. It means that all the writes done in a worker thread that happened before the join are made visible to other threads after the join completes. And this is important because remember we've talked before about how you can use these parallel computing frameworks like fork join pool, parallel streams, completable futures, and so on. We can use them in a way that often eliminates the need for explicit synchronizers in our code. But synchronizers play a very important role in parallel computing environments like Java because they also ensure that caches are flushed from cores to other cores so they can see the results of changes that they've made to their local state, to the, to the values of shared variables that are cached locally. And join is a synchronization point and it'll make sure that the caches are flushed properly so that once you join with something, you get the results of previous reads, uh, previous writes, so that the values show up correctly. And then finally, invoke will perform the task and block for the completion. So fork is asynchronous, but invoke is synchronous. So it's a synchronous call as opposed to an asynchronous call. Um, <clears throat> if the underlying computation throws an exception, then invoke will also throw an exception as well. Now, you very rarely program directly to fork join task. Instead, you extend one of the subclasses of fork join task. And the subclasses include recursive action and recursive task. Those are the two we'll talk about briefly. So recursive action extends the fork join task and has a compute method that does not return a result. So its return value is void. And you have to, if you, if you have computations that need to run in the fork join pool and they don't return results, then you would end up subclassing from recursive action in order to do that. What it'll do under the hood is it compute itself, because this is what you implement, so you may choose to split up the work into smaller subtasks that themselves are also forked to run in parallel. So basically what you do is you typically write compute to do that little algorithm I talked about before. If the size of the computation is relatively small or meant to be used atomically, you do it. Otherwise, you split it up into multiple parts and fork them in order to get them done. And uh, these smaller subtasks can be joined, but typically recursive action doesn't return a value. It cannot return a value because it's void. And therefore, we may store the results in some kind of array. And, and I'll show you an example of that probably on Wednesday. Uh, internally, there's a method called exec that the fork join pool calls, which in turn will call your compute method to get things going. So this is what's run inside the fork join pool by a worker thread in order to do the computation. 
So that's if you have no values that are coming back. If you have values coming back, then you would want to subclass from recursive task, which also extends fork join task. And it has a compute method that returns a value v. And this must be overridden to perform the task's computations. In this case, it can return a value. It also may choose to split things up into subtasks, so it kind of can do this recursively and have lots of things running in parallel. It joins the results of the smaller subtasks into a collective result that it returns from the function. And under the hood, it, it internally is driven by an exec call, which calls compute, which takes a result and then um, returns true, but the result will come back through the, the right means here. Okay, so that is the end of the overview of the various classes, both in fork join pool and in fork join task.